Minister Graceful, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's very heartening to see so many religious leaders and scholars gathered here to share ideas to strengthen social cohesion. And as we just saw in this lovely video, how our young people are coming together and having such uh, good insights from uh, learning from one another and developing such trust and understanding among all of them. Now, over the last two days, this conference has covered a wide range of issues on cohesive societies. As the international community becomes more diverse, both within each society and across societies, it is critical that we recognize our shared humanity and uphold harmony. Both President Halima and His Majesty King Abdullah II highlighted that everyone has a role in upholding interreligious harmony. We saw the religious leaders of Singapore reaffirm their commitment to safeguard religious harmony in Singapore. As King Abdullah II man reminded us, we all have a role to play in reclaiming the moderate voice on the internet, on social media, and in the public space. The conference also confronted difficult questions, like how, we should, how should we balance the different identities that we all carry, whether religious, communal, or national? And more importantly, how can we enable these identities to coexist in harmony? These are important questions, because in order to draw strength from diversity, we must first live in harmony with people who have different beliefs, customs, and practices. Throughout human history, we have had diverse societies. Not all have been peaceful, but many of those that embraced their diversity thrived. In this region, the Malacca Sultanate of the 15th century stands out in the annals of history. The Sultanate became Muslim when Paramiswara, later known as Iskandar Shah, converted to Islam after he met Chinese emperor and diplomat Cheng He. Emperor Cheng He, a Muslim, was on his way to Africa. Islamic culture blended with the Hindu and Buddhist teachings of the archipelago. As a port city, Malacca was remarkably cosmopolitan. Malays, Chinese, Indians, Arabs, Turks, Siamese and Burmese who were also Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, and Jews, lived alongside each other. They also intermarried and exchanged cultures. The rich history, rich culture of the Peranakan and the Chati Malacca communities are the legacies of these unions. How we draw unity from diversity is more important than ever because we live in an era marked by unprecedented levels of global trade, technological advancement, and human migration. These three forces have combined in a way that has not worked for some people, and this has fueled tension and conflict. In some developed economies, while global trade has benefited many, it has also sharpened the divide between the haves and have-nots. Industries and jobs are being disrupted by new technologies creating much uncertainty. Against this backdrop of anxiety, fault lines have deepened between different segments of society. This is exacerbated by the ease with which falsehoods, extremists and exclusive ideas proliferate through the internet. This has been exploited by those who seek to spread misinformation and sow discord to further their own agenda. Increasingly, nationalism and intolerance are displacing openness and harmony. We have seen a resurgence of ultra-nationalist and supremacist hate groups, an increasing hostility towards minority communities, breeding disenfranchisement and generating a vicious cycle of conflict. Every society will need to find its own path to cohesion, one that is shaped by its history, context, culture, 
and demands of the time. But there is much that we can learn from each other and work with each other in our efforts to build cohesive societies. Allow me to share Singapore's experience. Modern Singapore began as an entrepôt. People from all over the world came here to trade, and many stayed. These traders brought their own religions and beliefs. The Pew Research Centre has named Singapore the most religiously diverse country in the world. Today, we are fortunate to have peace and stability in our multiracial, multireligious and multicultural society. But Singapore was not always like this. We learned how to build cohesion the hard way. Like many British colonies, Singapore was managed along racial and religious lines before our independence in 1965. Communities were kept apart geographically. So we had Chinatown, Little India, and Geylang Sarai, where different ethnic groups were placed. Racial tensions were not uncommon. And in the, 50s, in the 1950s and 1960s, were turbulent times for Singapore. Over those two decades, several racially motivated riots took place, and a total of 58 people were killed while 835 were injured. When Singapore became an independent nation in 1965, building a cohesive, multicultural and multi-religious society was the government's top priority. To build cohesion in Singapore, over the years, we have approached it in three ways. First, we expand common spaces and shared experiences while preserving racial and religious diversity. We establish English as the working language of Singapore so that people from different ethnic communities would have a common language to work and interact with one another and with the world. We introduced the ethnic integration policy in 1989 to make sure that our HDB or public housing estates have a balanced mix of ethnic groups to promote interactions and foster racial harmony. We regularly rejuvenate our common spaces, such as hawker centres, community centres and civic spaces, sometimes all rolled into one, like our Tampanese hub in my constituency, and I'm glad that our young people enjoy our Tampanese hub. We emphasise the importance of shared experiences through our national school system and national service in the uniformed services. Through this, Singaporeans from all walks of life, regardless of race, language or religions, come together. At the same time, we conserve our cultural and religious landmarks and protect our heritage in precincts like Kampung Glam, Chinatown and Little India. We also observe and celebrate the fest festivals of the various ethnic and religious communities in Singapore. But like most other countries, our demography is evolving. Life experiences and needs are also more varied. So Singapore is more diverse today than before. Our increasing diversity means that our common spaces will be harder to maintain and must be deliberately nurtured and expanded. The second way that we use to build social co cohesion in Singapore is to stay vigilant to guard against forces that can tear society apart. We built and supported institutions to work together and foster understanding between different communities and groups. We established the Presidential Council for Minority Rights, which scrutinizes bills that pass through Parliament to ensure that they do not discriminate against any racial or religious community. We formed the Presidential Council for Religious Harmony, which advises the government on matters affecting the maintenance of religious harmony in Singapore. We also set up the National Steering Committee on Racial and Religious Harmony, whose membership comprises apex leaders from major faith and ethnic groups to guide the government's engagement on racial and religious harmony. At the constituency level, we have 89 inter-racial and religious circles, or IRCCs, that act as, act as platforms 
for community and religious organisations to network and collaborate. These IRCCs bring together people of different faiths to interact, to perform charitable acts and community services together. Through this process, we deepen understanding and trust. Besides the institutional structures, we have also put in place legislation to ensure that our fault lines are less easily exploited by those who seek to do us harm. To deal with hate speech and the spread of misinformation, we have, we have in place laws such as the Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act and the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act, which allow us to intervene where necessary to protect our society. This is an evolving threat and we must continue to be vigilant. As our racial and religious demographics shift, so too must our approach to building bridges and encouraging discourse. For example, homogeneity of religion within ethnic groups is on the decline in Singapore. We have more interfaith families in Singapore now where each generation may hold different religious beliefs. And we should use this opportunity to deepen mutual understanding. More people are also choosing not to affiliate themselves with traditional ethnic identities or religion. Today, 22% of marriages in Singapore are between people of different ethnic groups. And nearly 20% of Singaporeans do not identify with a religion. We must learn to include their perspectives in our discourses. The third way that we promote cohesion is to work hard to provide Singaporeans with better lives and to ensure that all Singaporeans get to share in the fruits of our progress. In growing our economy, we put a special focus on creating good jobs for all Singaporeans, regardless of which community they belong to. Our National Trade Unions Congress our labour movement encapsulates this well with the tagline, Every Worker Matters. Some workers have benefited more from this growth than others. And this is why we continue to work hard to address social inequality, to better distribute the fruits of our growth. We have been doing more to help low-wage workers better provide for seniors in their retirement years and to give children from underprivileged backgrounds a good start in life. Building an inclusive and cohesive society in Singapore is always a work in progress. And this is true, I think, for every other country. This is why conferences like the ICS, ICCS are important, so that we can learn from each other and exchange best practices. This conference brings together people from government, academia, religious leaders, and the civic sector. Through the Young Leaders Program, which is part of this conference, we reached out to the next generation of leaders. Everyone has a role to play in building cohesive societies. To Singaporeans in this audience, the government is committed to working in partnership with you to build a future where everyone plays a part and feels a sense of belonging. I hope that we can build a democracy of deeds, where everyone chips in with our various strengths and passions to build a society we can all be proud of. And to those who come from 40 countries around the world to take part in this conference, I thank you for the perspectives you have contributed to broaden our horizons. Countries around the world are all facing common challenges, be it global warming, global security, global economic growth, and sustainable development. These common challenges can only be tackled effectively if the global community work closely together. The foundation for this is mutual trust and respect, deeper understanding and harmony. We must build these foundations, not only in our own society, but across societies around the world. 
to combat extremist and intolerant views, we must work together to create an ever-widening ripple of understanding, trust and respect. I commend the initiatives of the Aman Message, a common word, the UN World Interfaith Harmony Week, the Christchurch Call to Action, and other similar initiatives to deepen dialogues and understanding. The many religious leaders gathered here have also called on all of us to distill the commonality across all religions, which teaches us to be good and to do good for one another, so that humans can continue to progress just as each society achieves more together than disparate individuals. The global community achieves more together when all societies can pursue common goals and tackle common challenges. To conclude, humans have a deep spiritual impulse to seek the meaning of life and the profundity of existence. For thousands of years, religious beliefs in different parts of the world have guided and nourished people. But sometimes, differences have led to wars. So it is very meaningful to bring together leaders, thinkers and activists of all major faiths across different continents to engage in dialogues, learn new perspectives and unite in a fellowship of respect and trust. I applaud you for your commitment to building cohesion as well as deepening understanding and trust. So thank you all for joining us in this conference. I look forward to continuing the discussion with you during the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, DPM Hey. May I kindly invite you to please take your seat. And, and joining, joining DPM on stage as the host for the dialogue is Ambassador Ong Keng Yong. He's also Executive Deputy Chairman of the S. Rajaranam School of International Studies. Ambassador Ong, please. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, for that uh, short and sharp speech to remind us of what we have been doing for the past few days and what we will be doing going forward. So, this is a opportunity for us to go a bit deeper into what uh, the Deputy Prime Minister had just uh, stated. I know that uh, many of you have uh, wished to ask him your own personal questions, but uh, in the interest of time, I have tried to bring in as many of the feedback I have heard and also looking at all the electronic slido questions that you have asked in the past two days and which some of it have not been some of them have not been answered. So I have compiled them into what I call three broad categories and during this next short period of time we will try to draw out Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, on some of these specific issues which some of you have put it so elegantly in your respective questions on the uh, Slido platform. And uh, my main categorization is on young feedback and then what some of the community leaders have feedback and then looking at all this wonderful digital around us, what it means uh, going forward in this digital age. So I hope those of you who have uh, written some of these questions, uh, forgive me for compiling them and put them all together in this kind of categorization. But I thought that it might be better to do it this way uh, so that we can have Deputy Prime Minister to go deeper into each of these uh, areas which I thought are important. So DPM, you saw the video just now, yes, and you say it's a lovely video. I think so. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe we could have stretch it a bit longer, but I think uh, the way our video producer wants to do it is in this short and sharp manner. So going uh, forward, we feel very uh, motivated by what some of these young people have demonstrated during their discussion over the past two days. And you hear them just now, uh, they are all uh, very uh, noisy. 
<laughs> whenever their favoured men or uh, women appear on the video. Uh, but uh, apart from being noisy, I think they also have an important message for all of us, uh -huh. which is that I think going forward, they share some of the future that we all envision together. Yeah, maybe you would like to just dive a bit deeper and tell us how yourself see the role of the young people going forward and what can they actually uh, tell us. I recall that you have made this particular remark that going forward, uh, governance and government require a lot of participation of uh, the citizens and these are the young people going forward. So maybe uh, they'd like to hear from you your own thought about some of these elements that uh, we are covering in this ICCS. Well, thank, thank you, King Yong. The, your question sounds like uh, now this is uh, not just an interfaith dialogue, but an inter-age dialogue. <laughs> and I, I thought your idea of extending the video a little longer so that we hear more from our young people is actually an excellent one. I'm sure all of you will enjoy listening to all our young people go a little longer than for me to speak here. <laughs> but uh, let, let me take a step at it. Huh? First, um, I, for our young people, you know, we always say that our young people are going to inherit the future. And I would add a very important point that if you are going to inherit the future, you should be now shaping the future. Because what you do today will shape the society that you're going to live in years down the road. And getting the fundamentals right is, is quite critical. So we, we try our best to uh, make sure that we can start it right in schools. Now, the, uh, s many of you in Singapore will know that I was education minister and maybe uh, enhanced our program on character and citizenship education. And a lot of a big emphasis on this was on the values that are going to serve Singapore well. And we used to have uh, this civics and moral education. We still do. We have the, the textbook. But our schools have done a more interesting way, which is to start this movement called the Values in Action. And for us, for our young people to learn important values, values of respect, of uh, responsibility, of harmony, of care, of integrity, it is not, the best way is not to teach it through the textbook, but really through action. And I'm very happy to see how in our schools, uh, from primary schools to secondary schools, uh, students are doing many of these activities. So a very key way for us to engage our young people to shape their future, to promote harmony across races, across religious groups, is for them to continue to be engaged in this Values in Action program. And for all of us, as, as adults, as parents, as community leaders, to support our young people in, in this very major effort. Now, the other bit is that we must teach our young people to appreciate uh, diversity. That diversity can be a strength, if properly harnessed. And happy to learn that in Singapore, 60% of our views have a friend, have a close friend from a different race, of a different race. So this is uh, quite a, a, a good uh, development. And the, we also have very good uh, initiatives by our young people to promote this harmony. So for example, the Interfaith uh, Youth uh, Circle has promoted this interesting uh, program called Breaking Bread and uh, Building Bridges to break bread and build bridges, where you bring people to come to eat together during the religious uh, festivals. So this is a very good effort that we must uh, continue to promote, and I hope that we can <coughs> enlarge this uh, effort. So for the first, to appreciate diversity. The second is, it is very important for our young people to take a stand against intolerance and extremist views. It is easy to sow discords and misunderstanding by representing a particular religion uh, in a very negative light or to pick on the negative aspects of it. In many cases, these are, in fact, in all cases, these are acts perpetrated by a small extremist group. And it would be wrong for us to attribute all those extreme views to the entire community. 
So our young people must take a very strong stand against this and speak out against such uh, uh, against remarks that may be derogatory, that do not show respect for other races, other religions. And going beyond that to even uh, uh, build bridges, I understand that uh, there is a youth uh, group that, uh, I mean, a, a, an initiative called uh, Bridge. And many interesting activities like, you know, ask me anything about the religion. So you gather young people from uh, young and old people of different groups to talk about particular religion and say, well, ask me anything about this particular religion. And in this way, you have the practitioners of that faith explaining to others what that faith is all about. And through the process, I think we'll find many, many common themes across all religions. This is an excellent initiative uh, to promote common understanding. So taking a stand against extremist view and taking the effort to build bridges, to build understanding across different religions. And of course, the other area is that we must uh, come together to do good things together. I think every religion teaches us to be a good person, to do good things for, our, for one another, for our society. And the more we can bring different uh, faiths together to do good together, I think the more we can promote a better dialogue, better understanding. So those are the, the few things which I hope that our young leaders will do. And I see your uh, youth leaders program. It's very good that you have bring, you've you have brought together youth leaders in Singapore as well as across the world to come together. And I'm sure our young people will have even uh, more ideas on how you all can do this together. And I'll be very happy to support you know, good initiatives in this area. And I'm sure Minister Graceful too. Just give us more money. <laughs> <laughs> well, King Yong, uh, I, I'm, I, since you gave me that, that opening, I should uh, take this opportunity to tell everyone that the hardest job of the finance minister is money not enough. <laughs> and it's a very unpopular job because, you know, all my colleagues will come to me and say, I want to do this great thing, I want to do these other great things. And each time I have to say no. So I was sharing this with my uh, uh, fellow uh, finance ministers when we had an ASEAN meeting. So this finance minister said, he said, Sweet Kid, don't worry, I have a formula to this. My colleagues used to tell me I say no 100% of the time. Then I found a good way where I say no only 50% of the time. So I was so amazed. I said, how did you do it? He said, very simple. He said, first my colleagues will come to me. I need money to do this. Then I said, no. And they will say, are you sure? And I said, yes. <laughs> so it's 50% yes. <laughs> yeah, I think many of our young leaders and uh, young activists, they are really inspired to do more. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, as we can imagine, these days, whatever we do, whether in Singapore or anywhere in their countries, uh -huh. they require resources. Yes. So plenty of energy, but you still need to bring people together you need to uh, do certain things and all these require the support. Maybe one way is for government leaders to encourage more business uh, leaders to contribute more yeah, and go back to the community and ask to partner the community to do more with the young people. Yes, so indeed we are doing that. So this year we are commemorating the uh, bicentennial and uh, Grace proposed that you know, we uh, create this bicentennial community fund and uh, where the tax deduction is two and a half times. And in the, for IPCs, we also have a double, uh, you know, double tax. Or we also have a matching fund. So every IPC can uh, get up to $400,000 in donations in a year. So the last week, I met two groups of people, all business leaders. And uh, I, I've been uh, doing what King Yong always says, selling koyo, right? So I've been telling all these uh, community groups, uh, these uh, business groups, I say, well, our corporate tax is not high, it's 17%. Uh, 
with a 250% tax deduction, it means that if you donate $200,000, you would only, the tax department will give you back almost 100000 So you're actually only contributing 100000 and the government will match this 200000 with 200000 So your $100,000 of donations will double, will, will have a three times multiplier to contribute to 400000 So they look at me and say, is it so? I say, well, you know, you guys are corporate leaders. You should know all these uh, statistics, right? So I say, I, I will promote it. And so please help us to promote this and get your companies to donate to the Bicentennial Fund, to all our IPCs. That's a joke. The finance minister, number one, he gave us all this technicality that we don't quite understand. <laughs> uh, number two, he take the opportunity to ask other people to give more money. <laughs> Okay, sir. <laughs> I'm just doing my job. I'm just doing my job. <laughs> I think we better uh, let uh, us go back to this ICCS. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, the audience uh, out there will be uh, wondering what we are doing now. Is the, but the reverting back to the reverting back to the uh, topic that we have about the activism of the young people. Uh, many of the media colleagues here have asked me whether they can uh, do more on, you know, this uh, technology platform mm. and they always say that the young people are very good at this mm. and we should encourage more right. of the young people to do some of these uh, discussions and bringing their uh, parents and other senior colleagues to come on. Mm -hmm. So this is an area I think the young people can uh, uh, really look at it. Yeah. Not all people of my generation can understand how to use some of these uh, techy stuff. Uh, so this is an opening. I thought I should uh, ask you something about the digital age that we are in now. Yeah. From your perspective, how do you see us using this kind of uh, technical technological devices to talk about a very important subject about our different religious belief, our inter-religious relations. Yeah. It's uh, sometimes very difficult to put all that we want to say about what we believe in and how we want to get our neighbours to understand our religion in 140 words on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 140 characters on Twitter. Yeah. So perhaps... Uh, this is an opportunity for me to let you tell us a bit more from your perspective with this digitalization, with this modern age. What more can we do to use this kind of conveniences that we have in our uh, present day for promoting what we call social cohesion, uh, better inter-religious understanding? Right. Well, that's, that's a very important question. And I've been observing the trends on you know, what is happening globally on uh, uh, e-commerce. And one very interesting trend is that the online-offline combination is now almost the norm in many of the places. There are things that we do online, there are things that we do offline in a fiscal setting. So the face-to-face -face interactions like this, where we come together to discuss important topics, difficult topics, uh, where we come together uh, in our <coughs> various religious uh, buildings, you know, religious, to, to uh, observe our prayers, to have, uh, uh, to listen to our sermons, all this remain very important. And it's important that we keep this face-to-face, uh, -face, people to people interaction. Now, so that's one important venue. That said, you are absolutely right that the online media is growing in significance. And this is a very powerful tool, you know, the online media. From the internet <coughs> to the email system, to uh, Facebook, to WhatsApp, it is proliferating so quickly that it has become very pervasive in every society. Now, this can be a great <coughs> tool for good, but it can also be a, a great tool for destruction. And how do we keep the online discourses uh, reasonable? Uh, how do we keep online discourses 
constructive is a key challenge for every society. And there are a few things that I think we must really, uh, we must do. One is that on the, we must prevent the negatives from spreading. You know, online falsehoods can be spread very, very quickly and it can lead to massive problems. Uh, just to give an example, I think in, in, uh, in the US, there were two groups, right? A group called the uh, Hearts of Texas, that half a million people who use online and talk about, well, they wanted to act against some uh, Muslim community, and they say, let's gather at this time and place. And then another group called United Muslims of America, they have fewer members, they have a quarter million, and they also did an online call to say, let's gather there and meet them head on. And in the process, the first group spread falsehoods about Islamic, uh, Islamic faith. And this is terrible because by spreading that falsehood and gathering people to come together and you provoke a reaction from another group who said, well, we must then unite. So you see how social media is used, A, to promote falsehood and B, to mobilize people to have face-to-face -face confrontation. This is very dangerous. And we must take a strong stand against that. In another example in Sri Lanka, the, the, there were rumours in the social media that Muslims were seeking to sterilise the Sinhalese majority so that the ratios would be a little better. And again, totally false. And can you imagine the, the kind of havoc that this can create? So we must take a very strong stance against that. And in, in places like France, they have uh, taken action against online falsehood. In Singapore, uh, we have uh, this act, the POFMA, the prevention, uh, the protection from online falsehood and manipulations. And I hope that our community uh, understand the importance of uh, POFMA in our multi-racial, multi-religious, uh, multilingual society, so that we, we take a strong stance. We cannot, we are not against free speech, we are not against dialogue. In fact, we should promote uh, discourses and reasonable you know, arguments and decisions, but we must not allow falsehoods to spread and to, you know, we must not allow people to go on hate speech to promote uh, misunderstanding. And our young people can play a very important role. So that is on the sort of... Uh, protection part of it. But beyond protection, I think young people can do a lot more uh, with all the different groups that are gathering in uh, various forms of interfaith dialogues, in your action, in your activities. Uh, all of you, young people are digital natives. You are far better than, uh, than us in uh, using the digital media. So please make full use of that you know, to spread positive messages, to spread constructive messages. In a session like this, where so many of you have been so deeply engaged in dialogues of this nature, use that to promote better understanding. In fact, this video that you all did for the Young Leaders Programme is so well done. May I suggest that you put it online on as many places as possible on what each of you has learned. This is a start. And if you are minded to continue with this, you know, to say how you are each doing your part, uh, you should create an online community to continue to spread good words and to promote understanding and trust, not only in Singapore, but across the world. Thank you, DBM. I have uh, one question which we got from the various uh, Slido uh, uh, uh -huh. uh, input. Uh, I think the best way is for me to just read you this question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we have heard over the course of ICCS how different sectors of society, for example, academics, policy makers, NGOs, religious leaders, have a role to play in social cohesion. Mm -hmm. Can DBM please share how you think society as a whole can work together to strengthen social cohesion in different ways? Okay. Well, I, th I think that's a very good question. And... Uh let me just pick up a point in my speech that really everyone has a role to play. And the question is, uh, what, how can we do it? 
I think fundamentally, the starting point must be that each of us believe deeply in our heart that diversity is a good thing, and at the same time, we have a lot in common with people all around the world, people in our society, regardless of our faith, regardless of our race, regardless of the language that we are most comfortable speaking, each and every one of us have a shared humanity. And that if we can appreciate that, then I think there's a lot of uh, room for us to work together. Then the next question is, what should each of us do? And I'll say that if I will just start first and foremost with our religious leaders, I'm very glad that uh, our religious leaders have been so committed all these years to promoting interracial, interfaith uh, harmony. Uh, I, I should share with you that you know when I recovered from my stroke, I attended the interreligious organization event. And at the end of the dialogue, every one of the leaders came up to me and said, Mr. Hing, we prayed for you. Uh, I was so touched. Regardless of race, language or religion, everyone came up to me to say we prayed for you. I was so touched. So I think this is something so precious in Singapore that we must really cherish and uphold and strengthen. So religious leaders play a key role day in, day out, when we meet your followers to spread this positive message and to come together to have this dialogue on what we have in common, what is it that we can do together. So this is a very important starting point. Then second, on the... Uh, and we must... All religious leaders, I hope, will, will certainly continue to take action against extremist views. Because in every group, there will always be extremists who distort the religious belief, who believe that this is the right way to go. Now, we have, uh, uh, on the part of government, taken action against religious leaders from other places who came into Singapore to preach, and then, they, then not understanding the context, you know, had remarks which are very, actually very inflammatory. You know, whether it is about starting a crusade or starting a jihad and so on. We have taken action against that. And we must continue to be vigilant. And I'm glad that our religious communities strongly supported the government in taking a strong stance on, on those uh, issues. But beyond our religious uh, leaders coming together, and uh, I understand that uh, you know, Grace Chest is the national committee bringing the different religious leaders together, the apex leaders, I think that sort of dialogue remains very important, where we help one another understand our religious beliefs better. So that is a great start. And we must continue this. Our IROs, uh, the, uh, it's an NGO, they gather together to promote interfaith understanding. So this is uh, wonderful. Now, um, I mentioned about what the government uh, can do, and I think as policymakers, uh, we must A, uphold the law, and where it, the law has a particular gap, we must pluck it. And this uh, protection against online falsehood and manipulation is one example of this, adding to our various acts on religious harmony. And uh, uh, you know, President spoke at the opening of this conference, and President Halima and our, the Office of the President and the, Council of, uh, the Presidential Council of uh, Minority Rights, Religious Rights, all these play a very critical role in, in our efforts. So, for the governments, I hope that we take the next step. I have uh, last weekend spoken about Singapore together and how we can build a democracy of deeds. What I hope to encourage is for all Singaporeans to continue to play a part in building Singapore, to make our contribution in whatever ways that we can and to come together to continue to build Singapore together, so whether it is in policy making or in charitable works, in taking care of the needs in our neighbourhood, in our community, uh, in, in, or with, for people with particular needs and disabilities. Now, beyond that, uh, you mentioned about academics. And indeed, I think it, it is critical. I mean, academics, A, you are in a 
position where you are influencing many young minds and that they look to you as leaders. And I hope that our academic leaders take their responsibility uh, seriously. So far, I, I know for a fact that in our schools, our teachers take a very uh, clear path on this and they do their best. But beyond schools, uh, in our ITEs, in our polytechnics, in our universities, we must continue with that effort. And uh, at the same time, academics do a lot of good research. And the research must focus on what do different religions have in common? How do we continue to promote deeper understanding? And, those, and that since academics have uh, the time and space to think hard about some of these issues, to study what different communities are doing uh, in Singapore and across the world so that we can promote a deeper understanding. And of course, our media, you also mentioned about the media, plays the most critical role. Now what, uh, there are many good stories of uh, interfaith harmony of action that we are all doing together. The media can help to amplify these uh, good deeds and to promote a proper understanding of the different religions. Uh, otherwise, if, we, if media reports in a, with a particular slant that distorts the belief system, that distorts the act of particular groups, then I think we will have a very difficult time. So the media plays a critical role. And earlier on you asked about the online. I hope that our social media can continue to play a, 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 a constructive role. You know, not, unfortunately, sometimes uh, when you read some of the social media, it has been very negative. And uh, I hope that our young people, and in particular who are digital natives, will go out and rebut these falsehoods which are being spread, or these erroneous views. And that our social media space can become a constructive space, not a destructive space. So uh, my overall message, I think everyone has a part to play. PPM, you mentioned something about democracy of deeds. Uh -huh. Maybe you can just spend a few moments to give us your a uh, bit more of your thinking about this democracy of deeds. Oh. How, do, how can uh, some of us in the academic world, we read your recent uh -huh. remarks, we understand where you are, uh, what you are trying to say about democracy of deeds and in the context of our this, uh, effort here to build greater understanding mm. among different communities and create uh, a stronger, diverse, uh, harmonious society. Mm. How this democracy of deeds can continue to uh, guide us? Well, uh, King, thank, thanks for that question. And I think in, in this context of racial and religious harmony, uh, it is particularly relevant. So, democracy of this was a phrase used by Mr. S. Rajaratnam many years ago. He was our first, deputy, was our first uh, foreign minister. First foreign minister. And, uh, you know, a remarkable man. So, he said, well, you know, in many countries, when they have a democracy, they think of democracy in terms of just elections and just, uh, you know, we, we decide once in uh, four or five years during elections. But really, and it's not just about just, you know, free speech and I'm free to share my views, I'm free to talk about this, but more fundamentally, it is about what each and every one of us in our society can do. Right? And in that regard, uh, there are many things that, each and every one of us can do. So you take the topic of uh, religious harmony. And earlier on, you asked me what can the different groups of people uh, do, from religious leaders to academics to community leaders to students. So every one of us in, in our uh, circle of uh, friends, in our circle of uh, contacts, in our daily work, can promote racial and religious harmony. That if we come across somebody who expounds the wrong view and that it is important for us to have the courage to stand up and speak against that. And better still, to think about what is it that I can do to help people understand this better. So it is not just, we're not just waiting for a religious leader or a government leader or our CEO or the company to tell us that you know, we should promote racial or religious harmony. It is for each and every one of us to do our part to promote that. I have uh, 
Uh, one very good example I have is that I have a resident. Uh, she's uh, Muslim. And she and her family used to uh, run a restaurant. So they have retired. So every Hari Raya, she holds an open house where she would uh, invite all the neighbours in the neighbourhood to come to her house to eat. And she erected a little tent. So the town council gave her a little permission to erect a little tent outside her house. Her house is on the ground floor. And she invites, uh, every year, she invites her friends and, uh, from the neighbourhood to come and eat together. And I've been there a few, on a few occasions. It's a wonderful occasion. So this is how a democracy, it is what we do. Right? Not just what other people do and how can I play a part. I recently was in a forum where I spoke to some young people. I said, this was uh, at a pre-U seminar. And they said, I said, what are you concerned with? They said, oh, we are concerned that uh, some of our students from more disadvantaged backgrounds in our schools are not uh, coping as well. So I asked them, what can you do? So they looked at me a little puzzled. Is, uh, what can we do? So I suggested to them, I said, would it be a good idea if students, let's say, who are in uh, primary five, you are in the same school, go and spend 10 minutes a day speaking to helping students in primary one or two to learn new words to speak better. Since you are already at primary five, you don't have to worry about your PSLE. You can do something like that. And all you need is five, 10 minutes a day and it can make a difference and make friends uh, with the students. Or for the matter, can you pair a class, a primary five class with a primary two class to do something? Now, this is a democracy of deeds. What each of us can do in our context without spending an enormous amount of time. HDB has a program on promoting uh, neighbourliness. So be good neighbours. And every one of us are neighbours with someone. So how can we uh, promote good neighbourliness in our community? I think... Thank you, WB Prime Minister. Maybe we should start winding this down. <laughs> yeah, um, From the look of some of our uh, friends here, they are expressing an uh, expression of hunger. <laughs> uh, so, but maybe before we wrap up, BPM, um, we spent the last few days here, uh, you have the advantage of looking from outside into what we have been talking and what we have been doing. Uh, maybe uh, share with us some of your final thoughts as we go forward, as we wrap up this uh, uh, ICCS. This is our concluding segment. After this, it's just uh, nice uh, food and uh, we'll bring them out to the different uh, places of worship and some other uh, interesting places in Singapore. But this is the last, what I call, classroom uh, environment. Uh, any special thoughts that you want to leave with us? Oh, okay. Well, thanks, King Yong, for that question. I, I would say that, um, you know, this year, we are, we are commemorating the Singapore Bicentennial. It is the 200th uh, anniversary uh, since uh, Sir Stanford Raffles landed in Singapore in 1819. And we have taken this uh, occasion to try and to reflect on our past. And the existence of Singapore was not just 200 years. It went back for at least 700 years from the archaeological records that we have and from all the documents that we could gather. And Singapore was already a major trading emporium for the region. But being part of the British Empire then plucked us onto an even more global network. And one important lesson that for, for all of us is that if you look at the developments historically over the last 700 years and in particular over the last 200 years, and even more so over the last 50 years. There are very important values that we as a society hold that allowed us to continue to make progress. One important value is openness, that our openness to the world, our openness to other people, that's allowed for that flow of people, the flow of ideas, uh, and that has really enriched our society significantly. And as part of that, 
our multiculturalism, you know, this embrace of a multicultural society where regardless of race, language or religion, and we come together to celebrate what we have in common. So multiculturalism is an important value and a conference like this plays a very uh, critical role. And of course, the one important lesson to cap it all is the importance of self-determination. Now, our fate will always be shaped by global developments. Any development in the world will have a ripple effect on us. You look at this uh, trade tensions between the US and China, it will have an impact on us. It is already having an impact on our economic growth, on our, on our business. So I think it's very important for us in Singapore uh, to understand this global context that we are operating in, for us to understand the major forces that are shaping societies all over the world. And at the same time, to do two things. One is for us to stay cohesive, stay together as one community. If you look at societies that have broken apart all over the world, it is when people harp on differences and accentuate those differences and forget about what they have in common. So by sharing our common, what we have in common, our commonality, as many religious leaders have emphasised, by emphasising on our commonality, by emphasising on what we have in common to grow together, uh, to advance together, we can stay cohesive as a community. And at the same time, you know, we are one little red dot, uh, but I think we can play, do our part in the, in the world. And the way we do it is not to have any, you know, for sense that you know we are that we are big, we are not. We are small, but we can be. Uh, if by our own success, we hope that we can offer uh, useful uh, platforms for discussions with other leaders from around the world. And this exchanges that we are going to have, that we that we, we should have, and that we should continue to promote, uh, is it will be extremely important for Singapore and for the world. So I'm glad that we have so many participants from 40 over countries you know, uh, here in Singapore for this very special conference. And I hope that uh, through this conference, you all continue to build a community that believes deeply in the harmony, that believes deeply in treating all people, regardless of race, language, religions or beliefs, uh, as equals, with respect, uh, with, and that we build trust and understanding across, within Singapore and across the world. Thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> For my <laughs> friends from ASEAN country whom I have invited to this uh, ICCS, this is the authoritative account you can get and bring back to your friends in your country to say what is Singapore doing about ICCS, why are we doing this? It's not just a PR exercise because they are wondering why we were all coming here to uh, participate in this. Uh, this is the concluding segment of our uh, time together in this uh, uh, setting here. As I said just now, there will be uh, some learning journeys for those of you who will sign up to go out to see part of what we have in our very multi-cultural and multi-religious Singapore. So I'd like to take the opportunity on behalf of the Ministry of Culture, Communication and Youth, as well as all our sponsors, in particular the IRO and our religious leaders in Singapore, to make this into a wonderful gathering where we can share and understand more about what we each are doing and how we can do things together. The takeaway, as we heard the first day, the Deputy Prime Minister, is diversity is okay. Right. And what we need to do about it is uh, how do we respond to diverse society and how do we continue to keep our diversity and yet uh, peaceful and uh, safe for all of us. 
So thank you for all your participation and support. Yeah, enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister and Ambassador, for an insightful dialogue.